accomplish that. The next method for consciousness change is we need to change the quality of our attention. This is directly in relationship to the information that we take in. Human beings are very definitively the product of the information that they have taken into themselves. So the quality of what we put in is going to determine the quality of what we get out, of what we experience, and what we, uh, how we experience the world. Thomas Jefferson said that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and what never will be. Truer words were never spoken. There is no such thing as the simultaneous coexistence of ignorance and freedom. It is one or the other. An ignorant population is an enslaved population. And a well-informed population is a free population. So this is why reading is so important. Reading really is a key to understanding. We need to read information that was considered important enough that the people that came before us placed it down in writing. And this is how we become informed. We take in good information and we become inwardly formed. That's what information is. The process of becoming inwardly formed. And by becoming informed, we can be reformed. We can make ourselves anew with the new information that we have taken in to ourselves. See, this is what we generally have right now in the mass media and the popular culture. People hypnotized, paying attention to propaganda and mind control. And that's never going to get us up to a higher level of consciousness to solve the problems that we're experiencing. We have to change the quality of our attention. If we continue along this route, we're going to become hypnotized. In the sense of the word, if you break it down into its into its uh, constituent elements. Hip in Greek is uh, uh, a word that relates to the depression of the spirit. And gnosis is knowledge or information. So hypnosis is knowledge or information that creates the depression of the spirit or a state of unconsciousness. And it puts someone into a trance state of mind. That's essentially... Now, I'm not talking about clinical hypnosis or hypnotherapy here. I'm talking about hypnosis from a fundamental point of view of being a trance state of consciousness. A, a one that is controlled by someone else and, and, and one, another person is placed into this trance. Often through their own will, through accepting that information, accepting the, the uh, practitioner's invitation to go into the trance. We're going into a state of hypnosis willingly by paying attention to the information, the, the, the often horribly poisonous information that we accept from the mainstream media and from mainstream sources. But now, uh, see if we follow along in that, in that uh, ideology, we're going to go into a state not only of hypnosis but of fascination. The word fascination breaks down to a fascination or a fascist nation. The word fascist coming from fasci, it's encoded in fascination. We break words down, we see hidden meanings actually encoded into words that we speak, but we don't really look at the, the underlying significance of the word or how the word breaks down. You go into fascination and that's the step toward becoming a fas fascist nation. We can go into a trance formation, okay? uh, a, a, a state of mind that resembles trance, mind control. We don't want that kind of transformation. We want a true transformation. We want to inform ourselves through the new alternative media that is truly a blessing and a gift that we have available to us, uh, possibly you know, uh, at this level for the first time at this wide of a scale, 
the internet is that new form of information and the new media that is arising on the internet is profound and it is really helping to awaken the consciousness of the planet and we need to use it and protect it and use it to its full benefit in our lives so we can undergo a true transformation to go beyond form transformation go beyond form the next uh, grassroots solution for consciousness change is develop true present moment awareness I talked about this a bit in part one this is getting over the notion of psychological time of being crucified at the place of the skull Golgotha uh, between the two thieves the past anxiety, uh, regret over the past and the future, anxiety for what is to come. As we saw encoded in this image of the Gnostic crucifixion, Jesus, the light of the world, crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull between the two thieves, the past and the future. And this doesn't mean focus on minutia. Present moment awareness isn't the focus on minutia all around us. It, it, it's not developing tunnel vision. Many people will think that that's what it means. It means really broadening our horizons and opening up our consciousness and our perspective to see the big picture, not to focus on minutia. It doesn't mean pay attention to every little single detail that is all around you and all the little minutia of, of everyday living. It means be in the moment, but see the bigger picture around you. Understand what is taking place within and understand what is taking place in your environment see the big picture from a global perspective, from a perspective that encompasses all consciousness. We need to get over our psychological notion of time as a quantity and as based in, in physical matter principles and endlessly repeating cycles of time and great new time gnosis uh, uh, techniques and ideologies have been formulated and have been derived from indigenous cultures such as the, the Mayan calendar systems that are out there. Uh, and it's the focus on time as a, an expression of consciousness and a movement of consciousness uh, through the ever expanding present moment. And uh, it, not focusing on it as uh, a, an endlessly repeating cycle or based in a physical process that is based on astronomical movements. It's the, the markage of time as the evolution of consciousness through time. That's what, that, that is what some of these systems of time gnosis that are uh, really gaining a lot of popularity in certain circles are really about. And uh, the mind counter is one that had, uh, I have been able to, to use to some great benefit in my life. Another method for consciousness change is one that I believe that currently we really do have the ability to take uh, and, and put into full practice because we have a lot of control over what we put into our bodies as far as diet goes. The, to change our diet is something that is within our control and is something that we can uh, all work toward if, if we simply use our willpower to do so. Because we talked about all the poisons in the modern Western diet and all the unnecessary drugs that were uh, uh, att people attempt uh, in the medical profession and the, the pharmaceutical profession to, to get us uh, dependent upon. The idea is to detach from these poison foods and really get focused on organic foods, organic farming, local food production for local populations because there's less stress on the, on the resources and on the land and less dependency on oil and trucking resources in from other areas. So organic food diet, whole foods, really nutritious foods, get off of you know, high amounts of sugar, high glycemic index foods, high carbohydrate levels, high sugar levels, um, just really uh, poisonous compounds in food, uh, get off of GMO foods, genetically modified foods, and on to just good, whole, organic foods. Um, and that you will really see a change in the consciousness. You'll see not only a change in the body, but you'll see a change in the clarity of, of your ability to focus your mind and to really uh, put your thoughts into manifestation. Uh, you really are what you eat. It, it actually is true. 
and uh, the body reacts to what is put into it. So it's not just informing ourselves through, inwardly forming ourselves through the information we take in, it's also what we physically put into our body to use as fuel. And this, this drives the brain. The diet has to do with the health of the brain, most certainly. So this is one that we all can do and it's within our control if we use our willpower to, to change our diet for the better. Monetary detachment is one of the hardest methods to actually put into practice because we have little control over everyone using the monetary system. Uh, we, we are largely at the mercy of other people using these currency systems that, that are in use around us, so it's difficult to detach from the, the monetary system. But to do it as much as possible, we should look at alternative forms of currency. Some people are uh, uh, trading in credits online, bartering online. There's uh, uh, different uh, forms of uh, cities that are, that are being used as hedges against the dollar and uh, ways to uh, uh, detach as much as possible from the fiat currency system that's really tanking from uh, the, uh, the uh, inflation that's going on right now. The local systems of barter are also a good way to, to uh, deal with monetary detachment and taxation. We have to consciously make up our minds whether we actually want to take part in the tax system. It is a system that is known as a system of voluntary compliance. We, there really is not a law that makes it actual, actually you, uh, an average American citizen liable to pay income taxes. We are voluntarily complying with this by signing these statements and these papers and many uh, researchers have written about this and have waged this battle to, to show people that the income tax is in fact unconstitutional and it is a system of voluntary compliance that knowing what our tax dollars are being used for to create more forms of control and wage more wars of aggression. We need to really make up our minds as individuals whether we are going to continue to go along with these practices. The next method of a, a grassroots, the next grassroots solution for consciousness change that we can employ is to begin to detach from our support for those acting in the role of dominator. This is a very important one and a very difficult one for many people to really comprehend and to really come to terms with because often these are people we know in our lives, that we love in our lives, and that we may understand when we come up to a high enough level of consciousness really aren't helping the situation. In fact, if we understand how the dynamics of creation work, they're really imbalancing the situation more and more and more and more. So we have to try to educate ourselves about what is happening in, in these instances and then try to bring that information to the people involved in these roles to the extent that they are capable of understanding it. Gerald Massey, Egyptologist, said, they must find it difficult, those who have taken authority as truth rather than truth as authority. The truth is the authority. Authority is not truth. It is not true that there is authority. But the truth, it itself is the authority that we need to live in compliance with. The dominators of the world have it exactly the other way around. They believe that there is such a thing as authority and the right to control others externally. And I'm not saying everyone should be running around doing whatever they feel like doing to people. That isn't what I'm saying either. I'm saying that control is really not the answer. Proper education is the answer. Properly educating people and getting them to, to live in harmony with natural law, not because they fear punishment, not because they fear reprisal, but because they have recognized the laws of creation, natural law that is in operation around them, and they understand that living in harmony with that is the only thing that can bring order to their lives. So these are the dominators of our culture, like the stormtroopers in Star Wars, the clones, so to speak, 
those who are exactly the same as each other and who think the same and act the same and follow orders like robotically programmed drones. And that's what the mind control of, of indoctrination that these people are put through to this regimented system of hierarchy and chain of command. It's what it is all about. It is about programming the mind to react. The reactive mind, the reptile brain, they're trapped in the R complex of the brain, base consciousness. And as such, again, I said this in part one, these are the most oppressed people. They're the most oppressed. We may think of them as oppressors, and that they may act in, in their roles, they may act as oppressors. However, they're actually the most oppressed themselves, because their consciousness is actually the most devastated out of anybody's. And if you really looked at a, at a very deep, focused controller's brain, if you looked at a, a PET scan or a SPECT scan of their brain, you would see that the neocortex is in utter disarray. The, the, the chemical coherence of, 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 of the electrochemical activity of the neocortex is devastated in, in a dominator's brain because it is so imbalanced toward the left hemisphere that they are so driven by the, the reptile instinct and they're so driven by adrenal rushes that the neocortex is in a very bad state of disrepair. It's physical brain damage is what it really is. Not to be extremely harsh about it, but that's what it is. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a physical disease. If you looked at the neocortex of some of these individuals, you would see that this is a physical pattern of brain damage that is actually done to their neocortex through these levels of mind control and imbalance. These are people who are in need of healing, not to be hated or to be derided and, and, and spat upon or anything like that or looked down upon. We need to heal these people. They need healing more significantly than most other people. That is how damaged their consciousness has become. So. This is like uh, Anakin Skywalker, who had the best of intentions, you know, growing up as a, as a young Jedi, and, but he became bent on control. He, he became, he went down the ideology that control is the answer, and in doing so, he gave over to fear, the dark side of the Force, the dark polarity, and he became Vader. He lost his true self. He became, uh, you know, he, he went into the consciousness of selflessness, lost the connection with the true self, and he becomes the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Vader. And this is how, this is what really happens in controller jobs. They start with the best of intentions, and it really descends into br brutality and coercion, and simply issuing orders and following orders, and it's all about control. That's what it descends into. It's just about I'm acting as God, and I will say what is true, and I will say what goes, and, and what you're going to do. So it's, it's a form of slavery, and uh, that's what all control, external control is. It's illusion to create opposition and slavery, when in fact, really, these people doing these jobs aren't the real enemy. They're oppressed by the enemy as much as we are, but they're just getting them to become oppressors like the sorcerers at the highest levels are. They're fu it's, like, it's like a psychological rape, if you really want to look at it, or a condition where uh, one is beaten when young, or raped when young. Okay, when we encounter psychological traumas like this, we go into defense mechanisms, and we decide one of two things. We either decide to identify with the master and become like them, or we go into shutdown mode, and we identify with a, a being that likes to be treated severely. So it becomes either one becomes a sadist or oftentimes a masochist. But more often than not, the abuser, uh, I'm sorry, the one who is abused, decides to act in the strength role, what they perceive to be the strength role, and they then become the abuser to enact that brutality down the line onto the next generation. 
So that is the kind of psychological trauma that these people really undergo at a fundamental level. And again, they need healing. That's what they ultimately need. See, the idea is it's okay if we act like that. Many people will see it like that. It's not fascism if we do it. We can go out and bomb countries that didn't attack us and kill innumerable amounts of children. We can go and create uh, torture facilities. But that isn't fascism because we've done it and we're the good guys. Well, it doesn't work that way. It still is fascism. And those who are enabling it are part of it. And those who are enact these things are part of it. And they're as involved as the people that came up with these ideas and decided to enact them to begin with. They would have no ability to enact these things if they wouldn't have people willing to go along with it. And that's the same with any war scenario. Wars cannot be fought if there are no soldiers who are willing to go off and fight wars. And that is on both sides. That is on both sides of the conflict. That is how war will be put to an end. When people come to a level of consciousness where they, they understand that they're not going to be controlled and manipulated anymore, and they're not going to be manipulated into fighting wars for rich men that don't give a damn about them, that are only there to profit from the endeavor. That's what our wars are ultimately fought about. And here's a person who is all too happy to explain that to you in the most overt terms. Henry Kissinger, a military strategist who actually comes up with the designs for positioning and strategies for engagements and, and, and helps to create strategies for positioning troops, makes a statement like this. Military men are just dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. Here's one of the chess masters, folks, telling you himself that he doesn't give a damn about you. He doesn't care about you at all. At all. You're a dumb, stupid animal to him. This is one of the people deciding where you're going to go off to fight. You're a dumb, stupid animal to him. To be used as pawns in a game of chess. He's the chess master positioning you, the dumb, stupid animal, on the board, on the floor of the house, a wanderer between light and darkness, never knowing which is which. So, people have to make up their minds. Do they want to wage war for people like this? Because that's really who's sending people off to war. They're never fighting. People like this never fight their own wars. They don't fight their own battles. They sit back behind the scenes, call the shots like the, like the gods that they think they are. And they send the poor and the the shut down in consciousness off to war to wage battles for them so that they can prosper and profit. It's all about who benefits. Who gains is the question that needs to be asked. So in, a fact, in fact, I understand people like this believe that they're doing something positive. They believe they're supporting people. They're not really acting in the best interest of the people that they, thi they think they are acting in the best interest of. Uh, you know that they may love the people that they're supporting, they think they're supporting in these instances. Yes, they love them, but the, the action that they're taking to support their family members who are going to go off to war isn't really helping them. They need to help them to raise their conscious awareness so that people will decide not to fight these senseless wars of human sacrifice, because that is ultimately what war is and always has been. It is a ritual of human sacrifice. And they're all too happy to wrap the soldiers up in all the occult emblems all over them before they go off and send them off on the altar of sacrifice. That's all war is, that's all war ever has been, and that's all war ever will be. It's a human sacrifice ritual. And the object is, don't support this. Explain to people what is, that it's a scam to make the rich richer and to do away with people that they look at as dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. We need to not support the dominator culture, the dominator ideology. We need to help people to understand that war is wrong in whatever context it is fought in.
The researcher David Icke explained this so brilliantly, I had to put this whole quote in the presentation because it encapsulates perfectly what I think about people who make these decisions to go and fight these wars. David Icke said, accept responsibility for yourself and your actions, thoughts, and words. You alone make choices. You alone are answerable, answerable to the consequences of your behavior. The feeble excuse that the establishment expected it holds no truth or justification. What is the point of having principles if you allow others to dictate your behavior? At the end of the day, you will judge your performance and the contribution you have made to creation. It will not be based on what another expected of you or what you did because you felt trapped. And how often do we hear that? I had no choice. It's something I had to do. I didn't have anywhere else to go or anything else to do or any other way to live. You hear this as an excuse all the time for why people go off and fight the wars that they fight. This is a cop-out. This is doing something because you felt trapped and you feel that it's expected of you. And that justification holds no truth. We are answerable to our own actions. And what we do in any given circumstances, no matter what was threatened of us, no matter who said that they would do something harmful to us in return, we take that action of our own will and of our own accord. And we are answerable to the consequences of our own actions. That's what needs to be understood. And in this role, in this helping, this process of healing, women can play an immensely powerful role and have and will continue to have an incredibly powerful effect in this understanding of what the dominator culture is all about and help to explain and talk with and really delve into the psychological makeup of the men that they love because let's face it, most of the people enacting this domination are men. Okay, They're, they're the physically uh, stronger of the sexes uh, as far as a, uh, a physical build and physical makeup and, and, and physical strength. So they're the ones who are really employed as this strong arm for the force that the, the sorcerers need to enact their will. And women will play a role because every uh, you know brother in this in this dominator culture, every son, every husband, every father, they have women around them in their lives. And these women can really get into their psychology, get into their psyche, get into their emotional makeup and have discussions with them and talk with them about what they're being used for. If you understand what this is about, you understand how these men are being used and manipulated, you need to discuss it, not suppress it. It needs to be brought out in the open and discussed so that you can begin to help these individuals go through the process of worldview healing and understand how they're being used as a pawn. That's simply how it is, and that's, that's the role that we need to actively take. The non-support of dominators, and one of the biggest roles to be played in this endeavor is the, the role that women will play in, in helping to heal that imbalance in consciousness. So the next grassroots solution for consciousness change is mindfulness. And this is interesting because it is kind of exactly the opposite of what the word is. We can understand mindfulness by quieting the mind and emptying it of thoughts for a time so that we can experience pure conscious awareness. And pure conscious awareness exists in the gap between thoughts. It's where the creative, generative principle of our thoughts derives from. It derives from the space between the thoughts, the gap, so to speak. So meditation is one of the practices that can bring mindfulness. It, it, it's a technique, a set of techniques that quiets the mind. It, it, there's many different ways to meditate. There's not just one meditation. There are sitting meditations. There are walking meditations. There are um, meditations that involve uh, deep breathing. There are meditations that involve stretching. There are meditations uh, that, are, that, that can be used in conjunction with music. 
there are an, in, innumerable forms of how to meditate, how the, the right method of meditation is that which works right for you, that which you resonate with and that which you feel comfortable with. Meditation is simply about turning down the volume of the active mind so that one can, for a time, bathe in the quality of pure consciousness, divorced from the chatter of the mind. We need to turn our volume down so we hear the true voice that is speaking to us at all times and it is only speaking one message. And that message is relinquish control. That is the message that is being spoken to us and we only hear it if we turn our mental chatter down. Because this voice never speaks of, above a whisper. It's a gentle voice that does not impose will or control. It is saying, attachment to control, the illusion of control, is what is bringing your suffering upon you. Relinquish control. Understand that which is. Live in harmony with that which is, with the truth. And then you will know order and peace and prosperity. But to do that, we need to get over the idea that we're in control of anything or anyone. You're only in control of what you think, how you feel, and how you act in the world. That's it. So relinquish control and do this through this process of developing mindfulness. Watch our actions. Watch. Be an observer of the self, of how we behave in the world, and turn down the volume of the mental noise of the mind. And you, this can be done through various uh, techniques of meditation. The use of entheogens in a conscious context is one of the next uh, methodologies for consciousness change. And that is critically important, the last part of that, in a conscious context. This means understanding what an entheogen is, what it does, how to administer it or take it yourself, and to use it for the correct reason, the correct in the correct set and setting, the correct psychological set, the correct physical setting, and for the right purpose. Because these are not toys. These are not games to play. These are consciousnesses to commune with. This is what true communion is. Not a dead sacrament, but an active sacrament. So the word entheogen, if some are not familiar with it, is a psychoactive compound that alters consciousness and helps us to experience a higher level, often a very strange level of awareness that is quite divorced from our ordinary state of consciousness. It is in a state of alternative consciousness, an altered state. The word entheogen means to create the divine within. It comes from the Greek words en, which means within, theos, which means the divine or God, and genere, which means to create. That's Latin, actually. So to create the divine within is what we can begin to do, begin to recognize the divine within us and to help cultivate it by commun communing with an entheogenic compound. Entheogens have also been called psychedelics. Psyche in Latin, in Greek, means the mind. Delun in Greek is a verb which means to make clear. So we can see things clearly in the mind when we commune with a psychedelic. It, they are capable of making the mind clear if they are used in a conscious context. Some of the most popular entheogenic compounds, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, or cannabis, psilocybin, or psilocybe, Mexicana, magic mushrooms, um, ayahuasca, or uh, Banisteriopsis kaapi. Um, this is the uh, DMT uh, being the active ingredient, uh, a, a combination um, that is added to the ayahuasca blend from the chacruna plant, sometimes even uh, pure dimethyltryptamine DMT. These are powerful uh, psychoactive compounds, some more powerful than others, 
that can really help us to go deep within our consciousness and explore the realm of the psyche within the, the rich tapestry, the rich realm that exists within each of us. And these substances are demonized and these substances are made illegal. Imagine that, naturally occurring compounds found in nature that are off limits to adult human consumption because you don't own your own consciousness. That's what this laws like this, draconian laws like this are saying to us. You as an adult do not have the choice as to whether you feel it proper to modify your consciousness as you see fit. We own your consciousness and we are saying that this experience is off limits. You are not permitted to modify your own consciousness, which you think you own, in a way that you see fit as a mature, responsible adult. I will tell you whether or not you are permitted to modify your consciousness because I own your consciousness. Imagine that. That's our laws that we have in effect in this country and in most others. And we think we're free. We believe that we are free beings when an experience has been made illegal. An experience in the mind is illegal. Imagine the hubris of the, the individuals who actually believe that they have a right to a, even attempt to say that they're allowed to control consciousness in such a way. Hubris. It's utter hubris. It's, that, that's all I can say about it. That's all I can say about it. Without getting extremely angry. The word sacrament, it comes from uh, the, 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 the word sacrum, which means holy or sacred, and mente, which means the mind. So again, the sacrament is that which can help to make the mind holy or sacred or whole. So it is uh, entheogenesis or, or induce an altered state. The, the, they're giving you a small piece of bread or something similar. It's an inert sacrament. It's, it's a deadened sacrament. It's not really a sacrament. It's a substitute for the real thing. That isn't what a sacrament is. A sacrament is an active uh, communion with another intelligence. And that's what entheogens are. Not to be trifled with. You try to trifle with these compounds and you'll find out exactly how much they do not really appreciate being trifled with. Um, it, they are consciousnesses. They are consciousness that are, that are there as teachers that we can commune with if we know how to use them in a respectful and conscious context. Terence McKenna, one of my greatest mentors, who sadly is no longer with us, he said, if the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness don't include the right to experiment with your own consciousness, then the Declaration of Independence isn't worth the hemp it was written on. We own our own consciousness. It is ours to modify as we see fit. No one can make that decision for us. And I will go so far as to say no one is bound to obey a law that forbids an experience within one's own consciousness. Period. And when we commune with these compounds, if we do choose to do so, they can open up vistas of creativity because they're really putting us in touch with the intuitive right brain. And then art can flourish from, from a communion with these uh, sacraments. And music can flourish and flow from a communion with these uh, entheogens. So it's one of the ways that we can use them to get really into deeper touch with the creative aspect of ourselves. The next uh, grassroots solution for consciousness change is the power of positive thinking. It's one I often struggle with, as do many people who... Uh, do research in this field. We have to keep a sense of humor. It's often difficult to do so, uh, knowing the weight and the gravity of the situation and how, how deeply along we are in this, but it's extremely important to, uh, to, to be able to look at it lightheartedly. It is also extremely important to see the glass as half full. 
try to recognize that we are making small steps and small progresses in the right direction. Try to see the glass as half full as opposed to being half empty and, and, and focus on the positive rather than the negative. Difficult. I, I struggle with this one myself. Understand that change is possible. Keep that focus in mind. Keep the eye on the prize, so to speak. Change is possible. And we need to not look at the asleep as uh, the enemy. We need to look at the asleep as ones to be helped and healed. They're in a state of worldview illness, worldview poisoning. So we wouldn't go into a hospital and start spewing hatred out against a cancer patient. They're ill. They have a, a disease. They have an illness. They're sick. Just like people who are really shut down in consciousness, they really have an illness. They are at disease. They have worldview poisoning. And what they need is healing, not hatred or resentment. And it, again, it's one many of us struggle with who are at a higher level of awareness and we want to beat somebody up because they don't understand what we currently understand. It's our uh, role to help them to come up in understanding and oftentimes you'll encounter people that are completely resistant to it and they, they're attached to their state of consciousness and attached to their egoic, uh, you know, self-centered worldview and they want to stay in that state of disconnection. And it can be difficult, and we, we need to, you know, work with them to the extent that we can. And if they are determined to stay in that modality of consciousness, perhaps it is better to allow them to do so and experience the the uh, the, the the negative uh, outcome that will inevitably result from refusal to change and to ascend in consciousness. They will find out eventually. We all will, in one form or another, uh, what. Our, um, our level of consciousness is really going to create for us. No one really escapes the lesson. They can only delay it. So uh, we need to help them to the extent that it is within our capability and then outside of the capability that you can affect, you need to know where the limitation lies and, and let certain individuals be where they are. That's a hard lesson to learn, extremely hard. So the final grassroots solution for consciousness change is to begin to reach out and teach others. And we can do this when we ourselves have, have reached a certain level of higher awareness, when we feel that we've grasped these concepts enough that we can begin to explain them in a way that uh, others are capable of understanding and, the, the, and, and in a way that they can use to improve their own life. And we should do this only when we reach what I call the three R's. The first of which is respect. We need to the, uh, understand that the word respect is from Latin. It means uh, re means again and spectare means to look at. So it is to take another look. That's what respect really means, to look at again. And in this context, what I mean by respect is we have taken another look at ourselves first before we really go out and bring this attempt to bring this information to others. We've come to a place of self-respect, self-examination. We've looked at ourselves. We've given ourselves a second look. We need to come to a place of remembrance. We have been dismembered in our past. We've all fallen in consciousness and had times when uh, we have fallen from our higher selves and acted in ways that we're not proud of. But uh, a true teacher is one who has remembered what the true self is. They have come, they have remembered themselves, brought all the pieces back together. And when they have become remembered, they have reminded themselves. They have re-enabled the proper worldview. They have re-enabled the proper operation of the mind. Been reminded. And the third R is responsibility. To come to a true understanding of what responsibility is. And this does not mean the left brain, western 
monetary worldview of what responsibility is, having so, this much money or having this kind of a job and taking on all kinds of uh, extracurricular activities and that means we're res a responsible person. That isn't what true responsibility is. True responsibility is response. Ability. It is the ability to respond to the circumstances and the situations that we find ourselves in in consciousness. Because we are aware of what is going on within ourselves and in our surroundings. And therefore we have the ability to respond to anything that in a proper way, in a balanced way, to any, any scenarios that might come up or might develop. That is what true responsibility is. And it is the understanding that, again, everything is connected. There is no separation between self and others. And every being's suffering is our own. And there will be suffering here for as, as long as one being is suffering. That is how you know that you're in any kind of a condition of suffering. You ask the question, is there even one other who suffers? And if the answer is yes, then you know that you're suffering because there's no separation between that other and yourself. That recognition is what real responsibility is founded upon. And when we have the three R's, we can give birth to the three C's through teaching. And this is helping conscience to be born into the world. Care. It's all about that four-letter word, care. What we care about is the creator of our experience. And if we care, to do the right thing, conscience is born within us. This is the second birth. This is to truly be born again is to be born in conscience. And this comes from the Latin con, which means together, and skieo skiere, which means to know or to understand. So conscience is common sense. It is that which we all know together. To know together is to have undergo conversion in this process of teaching ourselves and we help others uh, to undergo the process of conversion. So this word is similar to the word converse, to have a conversation or a conversion. To, uh, this comes from the Latin words con, which means together, and versare which means to change. So to undergo a conversion or to converse, to have a conversation is to change together. To undergo a process of change together is to undergo conversion. And ultimately it's about developing conviction. Convi conviction or to become convinced of something. Not because you simply believe it, because someone else has told it to you, but because you yourself have recognized it as such, as truth. The truth is told so as to be understood. It will be recognized as such. That is what the truth is ultimately about, not belief. It is about gnosis. It is about the understanding of something from the direct experience of that thing. Because we ourselves have gone off onto the path and we have come to a place of conviction. We become convinced of it because we ourselves have directly experienced that thing. And that means we have come to a place together of victory. Conviction comes from the Latin con, which means together, once again, and vincere, which means to win or to be victorious. So conviction, or to become convinced, is ultimately, it, mean, it ultimately means that we have won together. We are victorious together. And that is what atonement is really about. It is to come to back to oneness, to go home, so to speak. You go back to the place where we really came from.
The place where there is no noise of thought, where there is no conflict, where there is no chaos, where there is order and harmony and peace. And that is a place that exists within. That is the kingdom of heaven or the experience of divine consciousness and it exists within us. And we can reach that place if we turn our volume of mind down and we reach the state of atonement. And that, that, comes, that word comes from Latin as well. A means to depart from, tonare means to make noise or to create noise, and mente means the mind as we've seen. So atonement really means, if you break the word down, to depart from the making of noise with the mind, to depart from mental noise. It's how we unify the left and right brain hemispheres in this process of the chemical wedding that we've talked about bringing the, the masculine and feminine energies together to a place of balance to create atonement, to put ourselves at one mind, understanding that we are all at one and there is only one consciousness here. That's what the ultimate goal of all of this is about, to experience true oneness. And that is what it is all about. That, that, those are the grassroots solutions to help to elevate consciousness within ourselves and others. And that's what can get us out of this uh, divide and this real mess that we've, we've uh, backed ourselves into, the corner that we've backed ourselves into. So those are the methods for change. If we put them into practice, a new world can be born into existence. And with that in mind, I'm going to go into the outro, which I call the New World Order. So it doesn't have to be the dominator's New World Order, the sorcerer's New World Order, the, the uh, one that is depicted on the reverse seal of the dollar bill on the dollar bill, as it is used there. It, it doesn't have to be the, the pyramid of manipulation of stone being erected in the image of the blade, controlled by a male dominator sorcerer who believes he is God and has the light and wants to dominate and control everything on the surface of the earth. It can be the positive New World Order, where we take that pyramid of manipulation down brick by brick, one changed consciousness at a time to create the true great work the bringing down of this light to earth and instilling it in the heart and minds of each individual here. That's what the true great work is. Henry David Thoreau said that things don't change, people do. The change comes from within. We decide to make the change internally, not because it is imposed upon us externally, but because we ourselves have recognized the necessity for consciousness change in our own awareness. And it's all a house of cards, this pyramid of manipulation, just as we saw in The Wizard of Oz, where a lowly, small dog rolls back the curtain on the great grand Wizard of Oz and exposes him for a man, a simple man, a small, powerless, relatively powerless man that he is, that is just pressing buttons and pulling levers to create a giant illusion of control and power. But it's, it's really all a house of cards. And once we recognize the house of cards for what it is, we stop holding it up and it will collapse under its own weight because we're ultimately, again, our own enslavers. We are the sheep in the pen with the gate open. Free to go out at any time, yet we stay in the pen because we're so used to being in there that we don't know what true independence and freedom looks like much anymore. So we'd rather stay where it's comfortable, in the hassle-free zone. But ultimately, the decision to go out of that pen and into the true world of freedom that awaits us is ours to make. It's a choice between love and fear. It's a choice between the red pill and the blue pill, as in the allegorical movie, The Matrix. And we need to choose that based on our level of awareness and what we feel is right for us. Do we wish to awaken to that which is? Do we wish, wish to live in harmony with the truth and live in harmony with the, the laws of nature? Because we ourselves have recognized them as such. 
that's the choice that lies before us. And when we make that choice, we will see that change happen in the world. We will see that state of non-dualism uh, come forward and flourish and flower in the world. We will see the bonds that hold this world in bondage, the chains, the links of the chain that hold this world in bondage crumble and fall away. And there will be one world. There will be not one world government. There will be one world with no externally imposed government. There will be one world born into the new consciousness of freedom and the new consciousness of higher awareness and love energy, the, po the polarity of love. That's what we can give birth to. If we use our power of will, if we use our intelligence, our emotions, and our actions in, in a proper context to, to bring this new world into manifestation. And that is the true great work, and that is the true new world order that it is possible for us to create here. What we're seeing happen is an epigenetic evolution. Epi from Latin means, epi means to go beyond, and genetic, to go beyond our genetic programming. This is not a physical evolution. This is an evolution in the mind. It's an evolution in consciousness that is happening on this planet and on the individuals of this planet right now. We are undergoing consciousness evolution. Epigenetic consciousness. Epigenetic change. It's taking us beyond the limitations of our genetic programming and into the great um, cosmic consciousness that lies ahead for us. The, the great evolutionary process of unfoldment of consciousness to higher and higher levels of awareness. That's where the human future lies. And we can see that world. We can see that process coming into fruition. And if we go along with these changes and we don't reject these changes that are coming upon us, we can really, our lives can begin to flow effortlessly. And we can bring order and peace and harmony into manifestation in, in, in the real physical world. And this process is the process of awakening, the process of having an epiphany. This word comes also from Latin. Epi means to go beyond and Phanes is a uh, a, a Greek god that was the gar a solar god, the guardian of the gate of stars, the, the, the zodiacal band of stars. So just like we saw in the astrotheology section, he's a sun god, he's a god of gnosis and knowledge and information, and he stands as the guardian of the stargate. So to have an epiphany is to go beyond the god Thanes. It's to go through the stargate of cosmic consciousness to the true, undifferentiated void of consciousness that lies on the other side of that great divide that we experience as separation. And to come to a unified state of consciousness, a, a, a modality of consciousness known as non-duality. The understanding that we are one consciousness experiencing itself in the physical world subjectively and that is the vehicle for us to have experiences. It, the, the physical reality is not who we are. We are pure consciousness. We are in, infinite consciousness experiencing itself here to come to know itself better. That's what the true epiphany is about. To go beyond the limitations of five sense worldly reality to, to break down this negative, harmful, poisoned worldview that many of us are experiencing right now and to uh, really go into a state of whole brain consciousness, consciousness that is born of conscience that, that, that comes from the heart, the, 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 the polar energy of love, and to go through Phanies, to go beyond Phanies and go through the Stargate of higher consciousness and cosmic illumination. That is what this process is ultimately all about. Martin Luther King said that cowardice asks the question, 
Is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular. But one must take it because it is right. Powerful words from an enlightened man. Nelson Mandela made a statement that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And finally, the last quote, Mahatma Gandhi, the great teacher said, simply be the change that you want to see in the world because the external reality that we perceive around us is actually a reflection of what is going on within. As above, so below. You change what's in here and what's out here will follow. That's what it is all ultimately about. So I'd like to wrap up the entire presentation with three simple wishes, blessings if you will. One from the Eastern world, one from the Western world, and one from the place in the middle, the heart. So this is a Buddhist blessing, it's a prayer, often prayed by Buddhists, known as the Metta Prayer. This is the blessing from the East. May all beings everywhere be at peace. May the hearts of all beings everywhere remain open. May all beings everywhere awaken to the light of their true nature. May all beings everywhere be healed. May all beings everywhere be a source of healing for all others. May all beings everywhere be happy, and may all beings everywhere be free. From the West, I'm going to read a message from the Hopi elders. This is from the Hopi tribe of Arizona, Native American. You have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now, you must go back and tell them that this is the hour, and there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other, and do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a great time. There is a river flowing now, very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and they will suffer greatly. Know this river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore. Push off into the middle of the river. Keep our eyes open and our heads above the water. See who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. 
All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Extremely powerful message from the Holy Elders. And finally, I'd like to wrap up the entire presentation with a blessing from the middle. In my words, very simply put, as you prepare to go on this journey for yourself and go through the stargate of cosmic awareness, of higher levels of awareness and enlightenment, my wish for you is simply this. Have no fear be not confused. Lose control. See through the lies and deception. Find dominion within yourself. Fall in love. Know the truth. And the truth will set us all free. Go for it, and thank you.